This is the UFO iceberg. As we descend it from its summit to where it plunges into and beneath the water, we get to deeper levels of disclosure, which we can divide into four levels. It all starts at the top, when compelling evidence convinces us that UFOs are real. Take for example this video, which comes to us from a couple as they drove through Oregon. Notice the light and its reflection from all over the ground and how it shines through the trees. Or how about this video of a low-flying orb taken by these UFO watchers in British Columbia? Here. Me too comfortable driving theater style. Yep. And I've got the cameras going. I'm doing some time lapse. Stuff has been seen over the mountain, and we're hoping to see some stuff tonight. We'll be out till quite late. I got it. Again, notice the way the light shines from behind the trees in the woods. Yeah. Now let's look at the famous Heflin photos, which were similarly convincing way back in the 60s. In some of the best UFO photographs ever taken on August 3, 1965 in Santa Ana, California, Rex Heflin photographed a saucer-shaped craft from the driver's seat of his work van on 3000 ASA Polaroid film issued to him by his employer, the Orange County Road Department. There he worked as a highway maintenance engineer and had been in the midst of his duties when a saucer-shaped craft appeared, interrupting his radio communication and compelling him to photograph its passage just in front of his van. I first observed it out the uh, left window of the cab and I thought it was a conventional aircraft at the time. However, just a second or so later, it became obvious it wasn't a conventional type aircraft and uh, attracted my interest to uh, the point of picking up the camera and actually taking a uh, photo of it as it crossed the road in front of me. And uh, I simply took the camera and aimed a quick picture and uh, these type come out and are developed out of the camera. Another sequence followed as the object moved across and out the other side, the right-hand side and it was removed. All of these photos develop outside the camera. Well, this photo is uh, the number one photo taken through the windshield of the cab, followed by a number two photo out of the right-hand window, and then, of course, the number three photos. I think they're remarkable photographs, not because I took them, but because what they uh, portrayed and show, and uh, as far as the rest of it, I could care less as to who believes what, because I know what I saw. From evidence like these, millions of people over many generations have arrived at the conclusion that UFO craft exist and defy conventional laws of physics. We say conventional because, as we'll see by the end of this video, there is good evidence that the unconventional physics of these craft have been known for some time. The topic of secretly back-engineered or otherwise engineered UFO technologies will be the primary issue this week in Congress, beginning with the testimonies of witnesses and whistleblowers like David Grush and David Fravor. You heard from him right here first on News Nation. Now UFO whistleblower David Grush will take the stand on Capitol Hill. He is set to testify at the House Oversight Committee's hearing next week. Grush is the former Air Force officer and high-ranking intelligence official who set those investigations into motion. He gave News Nation an exclusive interview about what he calls a secret government program that retrieves craft of non-human origin. Grush will be joined by two other witnesses, including Ryan Graves, the former Navy pilot who told News Nation about his team's encounter with UFOs on the East Coast. 
Having already acknowledged the existence of these craft, these testimonies are bound to take Americans into the second and next level of the UFO iceberg. Extraterrestrials. Do we have bodies? Do we have species of well, well naturally, um, when you recover something that's either landed or crashed, um, sometimes you encounter um, dead pilots. What we're seeing. All right, we're looking at the interview suite at S4. Uh, it's kept dark for the comfort of the aliens. The uh, figure who is just barely visible in the left foreground is the telepath. And behind the camera is a raked seating area for observers. Although in this case, I believe the only other person uh, present was a military aide. The alien is seated behind a glass partition in a biocontainment area, which is maintained at biosafety level 2, the lowest uh, designation. That's primarily for the uh, protection of the aliens, not us. The theory is that uh, if they were going to infect us with an alien bug, it would have happened 50 years ago. Um, in fact, uh, all the indications are the aliens eliminated microbial and viral life from their own ecosystem long ago. They aren't susceptible to our diseases directly, but it has been shown that microbes can reproduce and form colonies within their respiratory systems, which tends to exacerbate the debilities they seem to suffer anyway in our environment. Uh, in fact, you can see here, the alien is beginning to flag uh, the interview was not going well. The telepath was trying to clarify some points from a previous interview, but he wasn't receiving coherent responses. As you can see, the being is in real distress. At this point, the telepath is uh, sending out a message to the medical staff. Uh, he's trying to communicate with the alien, but he's getting no response. There's very little he can do. He, there's no direct connection between uh, his space and the uh, biocontainment area. That's the aide stepping in on the right. Uh, the medical staff should be there by now. They're, they're slow in responding. There they are. I have to say the medical personnel at S4 are less than first rate. They tend to be selected for their willingness to keep secrets rather than their medical competence. By the way, he's not shining that light into the eyes. It looks that way, but in fact, he's checking for hemorrhaging around the eye sockets and uh, in the nasal cavity. I'm sorry. It's very hard for me to watch this. Most of the photographic evidence of these beings is withheld from the public, as in the famous case of the Holloman landing footage. During a routine photographic mission, a tech sergeant and staff sergeant of the base photographic team were aboard a helicopter at the time and run off several feet of film of the three objects, one of which breaks away and begins a descent. A second high-speed camera crew on the ground runs off approximately 600 feet. The cameras continue to roll as the extraordinary vehicle comes into view. It hovers, almost silently, about 10 feet off the ground for nearly a minute and yaws like a ship at anchor, then sets down on three extension pads. The commander and two officers, along with two base Air Force scientists, arrive and wait apprehensively. A panel slides open on the side of the craft, stepping forward, one, then two, and a third, what appear to be men dressed in tight-fitting jumpsuits, perhaps short by our standards, with an odd blue-gray complexion, eyes set far apart, a large pronounced nose. They wear a headpiece that resembles a rope-like design. The commander and the two scientists step forward to greet the visitors. Arrangements are made by some sort of communication, and the group quickly retires to an inner office in the King One area. Left behind stand a stunned group of military personnel. Who the visitors are, 
where they're from and what they want is unknown. And I was involved in one of the key stories that, that confirms that they're not covering up. And that was the story of the Holloman Air Force Base film. This is one of the stories I put in the book to say, if you believe they're covering up, you've got to explain this. 1969, the U.S. government, Air Force, shuts down Blue Book. And they say, okay, CIA is already out of it. They've already said, we're not interested in UFOs. We don't study UFOs. 1969, the U.S. Air Force sh shuts it down. And what I say, they're not, they're not shutting it down. They're moving it into the black world. They're shutting down the white world to allow them to research in the black world without having to answer for every stupid UFO sighting. And so they shut it down, and in 1969, they're off the books. They say, there's no ET, there's no cover-up, there's no uh, uh, evidence of withholding documents, that sort of stuff, and no national security implications. And that's it. So they shut it down, and in 1973, they go to Bob Emenegger and Alan Sandler, two producers in Los Angeles, and they ask them to do a UFO documentary. They have eight documentaries, defense documentaries, and at the end, we want you to do this other one on UFO, on UFOs. And Bob Emenegger, who's a total UFO skeptic, said, what do you mean this is for real? And at that point, the security manager, Paul Shardle, at Norton Air Force Base said, what would, you, what would you say if I told you that we had landed, that an alien ship landed at Holloman Air Force Base, six o'clock in the morning in May of 1971, and we filmed it from three different vantage points, two on the ground, one in a helicopter, and we will allow you to use the film for your documentary. So here you go, and what Bob said is, he's still not interested in UFOs, he watches Comedy Channel, he's not interested in UFOs. He said, these people are all crazy, this, there, there's no cover up. I was able to go wherever I want. He went into the Pentagon without signing in. He was able to go and talk to all the Blue Book heads. He was talking to Art Lundahl, who was the big CIA guy for UFOs stuff. He said, there was no cover up. I could ask whatever I want, and it was true. He could ask wherever he wants. So he puts his documentary, and then what happens at the end of the documentary is they say, we can't use the film. We can't allow, it's the Watergate, it's bad timing, we can't allow you to use the film, and they pull the film. At least that's what I thought. Then when the film gets released, it's a, a documentary called UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, $250,000 from the MacArthur Foundation, and then the MacArthur people say, oh, Mr. MacArthur's having trouble with his friends. Uh, he's getting a hard time about doing this UFO thing. Uh, we'd like you to pull his name from the credits, but you can keep the money. And so here it works. And so he, they get the money. It's a secret source for the money. It comes in, and then they put the documentary out, and then I find out that there's eight seconds of the Holloman Air Force Base film in the film. So Bob's my friend. I phone up Bob. There's eight seconds of film in there. And he goes, well, yeah. And I said, you told me they've pulled the film. You told me it was sent back to the Pentagon. And he said, well, it did. And he told me this whole story about the guy going across the country in this small Datsun, taking the film back to the Pentagon. I said, but there's eight seconds of film in the documentary. And then he said the key words. He said, but it didn't show anything. And I said, oh, no, he said, it's background. And I said, background? What do you mean it's background? And he said, it didn't show anything. And what it is, is you see the hills of Holloman, and you see this object, this brilliantly lit object at 6 o'clock in the morning coming over the hills, but it's in a distance. So it, you don't see it close up, and you don't see the alien when the alien gets out. That's the classified part. So they want you to know that Holloman happened, and they allowed them to use this, the eight seconds of the film but the rest of the film, the classified part, was pulled. While movies like Star Wars have popularized the concept of humanoid aliens, it might seem unlikely that spacefaring species are almost invariably humanoid, even if they look funny and weird. But the truly mind-bending conclusion from a consideration of all the evidence is that many of these beings are not just humanoid, but seem very human. There are two crashes that are so important that the government will go to any lengths to prevent you from finding out. And those are two crashes which occurred near the city of Aztec, New Mexico. Why? Because both of those crash craft contained human body parts. This observation, along with the observation that many of these craft are semi or fully autonomous, is what takes us beneath the waterline, which represents the intended level of disclosure. Beyond this line, which is represented by the water, 
Governments and corporations are no longer able to claim they do not yet understand or have not already constructed many such craft and had contact with higher civilizations not of this world. To see beyond just the intended level of disclosure, we first need a unified understanding of electricity, gravity, and the other forces of the universe as geometries of space-time. Gaining this perspective leads one naturally to the third, deeper level of the UFO iceberg, a proper space-time physics that accounts for space-time torsion and the physical, geometric nature of the vacuum. Torsion is a local form of gravity that may be induced by particular configurations of rotating electrical machinery that might couple to intrinsic quantum particle spin in the same way ferromagnetic materials do. One of the first to induce this phenomenon was Nikola Tesla, as in his famous Egg of Columbus experiment, where he induced spin in a copper egg standing on one end by a rotating magnetic field. We can tell that space-time is an abstract physical material by properties like the zero-point energy and phenomena like the Casimir effect. But there is perhaps nothing more convincing than the words of its master, Albert Einstein, who said, But even if these possibilities should mature into genuine theories, we will not be able to do without the ether in theoretical physics, i.e. a continuum which is equipped with physical properties. For the general theory of relativity, whose basic points of view surely will always endure, excludes direct distant action. But every contiguous action theory presumes continuous fields, and therefore also the existence of an ether. In other words, according to Albert Einstein, the physical nature of the vacuum is required in the geometric theory of space-time, general relativity. When we consider things as simple as the aurora, or as complicated as the large and small-scale torsion of a five-dimensional fractal space-time, we see evidence that empty space isn't empty at all. 99% of the filamentary structure we know weaves throughout the cosmic web at the largest scales of the universe are made out of plasma. This plasma must exist as a conductor if electricity is conducted to the auroras from the sun. This is somewhat misleadingly known as solar wind. Now we just need one more thing, evolutionary biology, namely Simpson's law of biodiversity and its extension by the principle of biolocomotion. Proposed in 1953 by George Simpson, Simpson's law of biodiversity states that major bursts in evolution and thus diversification occurs from adaptations to new adaptive zones. The principle of biolocomotion is a simple extension of Simpson's law where, from the point of view of physics, we simply associate the major adaptive zones of Simpson's law with the phases of matter that constitute the separate geospheres, solids in the lithosphere, liquids in the hydrosphere, and gases in the atmosphere. Equipped with the fact that plasma exists in 99% of what we call space, how natural to simply extend the geospheres there and consider the next logical phase of matter after gas, plasma, as the substrate of a new geosphere and major adaptive zone. Furthermore, when we consider how the five-dimensional space-time metric tensor is equipped with the electromagnetic vector potential, it is clear that the true substrate of outer space and everything else is space-time. 
When we think of space-time in this way, physically, and consider the process of biodiversity, we get a new geosphere, the astrosphere. Just as fish are well adapted to traverse the hydrosphere by the manipulation of liquid water, and birds are well adapted to traverse the atmosphere by the manipulation of the gaseous air, it is totally logical to expect to find new, semi- or fully mechanical life forms that are well adapted to traverse the astrosphere by the manipulation of electricity and gravity. In other words, the manipulation of space-time, which we know is possible in torsion physics by particular configurations of rotating electrified machinery. And this is just what we see. From this point of view, the people in these craft are more than just extraterrestrials from different planets. It could be that both we and these creatures occupy a single higher dimensional world. The isolated bodies of our planets become like isolated lakes are here on Earth, separated not by an empty void as popular science has obsessively pushed for decades, but an actual material, just like the air and earth that separate fish from each other in different lakes. This is called the superterrestrial theory of UFOs, constructed now more solidly on the foundation of an astrospheric cosmology and proper space-time physics. And it's super important to realize here that under this theory, and only under this theory, are the extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional and extra-temporal or time-traveler theories unified and simultaneously correct. This is the fourth and final level of the UFO iceberg, when our application of biodiversity to a proper space-time physics by way of an astrosphere leads us to consider that humans and humanoid superterrestrials like us actually share compete and cooperate in an astrospheric habitat of a single higher dimensional world. Like all adjacent species in an ecosystem, the relationships between our species are coevolutionary, meaning they affect each other's evolutionary development by some form of competition and or cooperation. Thus, if higher civilizations exist, then we should expect to see them divided into two broad groups reflective of either their competitive or cooperative relationship with our own civilization. If evolution occurs at the level of the gene, as biologist Richard Dawkins has famously pointed out, then it's by likeness and a desire to perpetuate one's own genes identified in some other that benevolence and cooperation typically occur. In this way, if some higher civilization acted benevolently towards us, it's rational to expect them to resemble our own species closer than that of other, less cooperative civilizations. While most UFO interactions are evasive and benign, being neither cooperative or competitive in nature, those few that are not are reliably divided into two groups. I described various missions off planet to, to the moon, uh, to Jupiter's, uh, out in the orbit around Jupiter, uh, Ganymede, the moon, that you know, these anti-gravity technologies are so advanced that JP was able to get there and back in a day. I mean, they, they can travel to the moon, uh, to, to Jupiter and Ganymede in a day and come back. It's unbelievable. And this is where I want my audience right now to just have an open mind here. This is unbelievable to me. I mean, I've been doing research on the secret space program for years, uh, not to your level, of course, but I, I just can't, to me, this is the next step, this disclosure about the secret space program. Like the craft is one thing, the reverse engineering of these craft is one thing, but to know that the United States has actively been involved with extraterrestrials uh, having off-world meetings on moon bases uh, for for decades, really. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here, right, Doctor? Well, that's right. Yeah, there's been uh, these relationships with different extraterrestrial uh, factions, and so this is where it becomes important that we distinguish between 
uh, different factions that uh, just as humanity is divided into different nations with their own agendas and their own cultures, uh, extraterrestrials also are divided in terms of their, uh, their kind of uh, species, the appearance, and their, their political agendas, um, you know, boiling it all down to the, the simplest terms. I think in a way, uh, extraterrestrials can be divided into, into groups that are all into kind of a, a centralized control and, and they will manipulate people to achieve that. And other groups of extraterrestrials, which are largely the human looking groups, but not exclusively, who are more freedom loving and kind of like democratic in principle. So in a, in a way, the extraterrestrials mirror the kind of political ideologies uh, of, of humanity. I mean, you can go back all the way to, to the ancient Greeks and you see the same thing. You know, you, you see uh, two factions. You know, one was the, the Greeks that loved uh, democracy, freedom and liberty. And then you had the Persians that were all were about centralized control under one monolithic rule. And, you know, that battle has been going on for thousands of years on Earth. And it's the same battle on uh, that's going on in space between the different extraterrestrial factions. Just as evolution predicts, beings that largely resemble us are typically associated with benevolent interactions with our own kind. Take, for example, the case of Father William Gill upon witnessing a large disc hovering outside of the Catholic school he taught at in Papua New Guinea in 1959. One of the most credible witnesses we interviewed was an Australian minister, the Reverend William Gill, posted before the time of his sighting to the Anglican mission in Boinai, Papua New Guinea. One night at 7.45, as he stood with 38 other people at the edge of the mission playing field, every one of them saw the same thing. Can you imagine what it's like to look up in the sky and see a totally foreign looking object. They're sta uh, just hovering, uh, not very far high up, maybe two or three hundred feet uh, up in the air and glowing and two uh, bipods jutting out from behind it, from uh, underneath it and sparkling all around and some figures up there this solid looking object and figures walking about on top and not the slightest noise whatsoever. And so we waved. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get this object down onto the playing field? And as we waved, wondering whether we'd get some recognition and whether perhaps they would uh, understand what we wanted, they waved back. Take also, for example, the account of Jessie Rostenberg in Staffordshire, England, 1954, in which she clearly observed humans who looked very much like her and looked upon her with a sympathetic expression. I went outside to find my two sons lying flat on the ground in the garden in front of the house, shouting, Mummy, Mummy, there's a flying saucer. Well, naturally, I just said, come on, don't be stupid come in the house, but felt sort of a strange sensation. Uh, wended my way up the side of the house to where we had a pump, where we used to get all our water from, and um, automatically looked up to see this, all I can describe, this huge Mexican hat. It was stationary, this thing, and it was bright silver in color, and it had a dome a dome, it was tilted to sort of, I could see the occupants in it. You saw people in it? I saw people in it. There were two people in there. Um, these people were beautiful people. That's the only way I can des describe them. Um, they had long golden hair, like a page boy, page boy Bob, just like the old kings. You used to see photographs of the old kings and the, the colour of the hair was golden. Now, I was really... What I, were they dressed in? They, they had a sort of a pole neck jumper affair, like a ski top suit, mm. in, in pale blue. Now, 
these people weren't sat behind, one behind the other. They were sat together, but this, whatever it was, was tilted so that I could see them and they could see me. Were you looking at them through windows, through portholes? Um, no, not portholes. It was just sort of the, like a cockpit, I suppose, that had this perspective or glass or whatever it was. They could see me anyway and I could see them. And they just looked. And I was absolutely paralytic with fear. I couldn't move, although my mind was ticking over. And they looked so sympathetic that I was just mesmerized for what seemed to be, oh, ages, but it could have only been seconds. And I turned to sort of look down at the boys, was unaware that they were with me because I was so absorbed. And the next thing, I looked up and it was gone. If we only encountered benevolent creatures of higher, more advanced civilizations, then no doubt the truth about UFOs would be known by now. But unfortunately, this is not the case. In what is described by UFO expert Nick Pope as a secret too great and terrible to be told, the predatory nature of certain higher species our helplessness to them and the alleged collaboration of some with them occupies the deepest realms of the UFO iceberg. Attempts to keep this and all related aspects of the UFO phenomenon secret have led to some of the most controversial moments in the history of our civilization. These attempts have ranged from the assassination of presidents like John F. Kennedy as determined originally by New Orleans DA Jim Garrison, or to merely airbrushing UFOs out of NASA imagery as exposed by former NASA employee Donna Hare. I had the opportunity to do extra work during downtime, which was between missions, and I walked into a photo lab, which was the NASA lab across the hallway. I had a secret clearance which is not that high, but I was able to go into restricted areas, which this was. Uh, at the time, I was talking to one of the techs in there, and he drew my attention to a photograph, that a NASA photograph. It had a dot on it, and I said, what is that? Well, he drew my attention to it, and, and I said, is that a, a dot on the emulsion? And he said, and he's smiling, and he has his hands crossed, and he said, uh, round dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And this was an aerial photograph of the Earth, I, I'm assuming the Earth, because it had pine trees on it, and the shadows of the craft, or whatever it was, were in the same angle as the trees. And by its very nature, UFO, and I wanted to clarify that to a gentleman that was talking to me, means unidentified, so I did not know what this was. But I realized at this point that it's very secret, that the, it was kept secret because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. Due to their being in the sky, airborne humans are far more likely to encounter UFOs, and they are often spotted in proximity to aircraft. One of the first recorded cases of this is known as the 1966 Oldfield Saucer, in which a UFO is clearly filmed on 8mm film by an elderly couple aboard an airliner over England. Uh, a couple who live in a cottage outside Manchester took their first airline journey, uh, and they had aboard a little uh, a film, a little cine camera, and uh, they take uh, pictures down of the fields as a couple would the first time they've ever been in an aeroplane. And she takes uh, what she thinks is an aeroplane coming up uh, from behind them, and then it goes out of uh, vision in about 12 seconds or thereabouts. And she goes on taking a few more bits of the, of the distant clouds and puts it back. And when they get, what's this thing? I mean, it's, it's, 
It's inexplicable by any, uh, unless it's a, a straight fake. And to fake, uh, to fake an eight millimeter film in color wants a lot of equipment. Uh, and who on earth are these, this charming couple, what, what would they be doing uh, lending themselves to faking these? It is nothing airborne we've ever seen. I mean, it is basically sausage shaped with two dorsal and two ventral fins. <laughs> and as you look at this film, it turns away on its vertical axis from you and goes, disappears out that way. Well, I mean, you can argue until you're blue in the face. What is it except something that uh, is airborne by a force, probably electrogravitic force of some kind that we know nothing whatever about? Uh, it is nothing conventional. It is nothing unconventional aerodynamically. Often, however, these airborne encounters are not so innocent. Take, for example, the famous last radio transmission of Australian pilot Fred Valentich upon encountering an aggressive UFO mid-flight in 1978, in which he stated, It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft, just before a loud metallic grinding noise is heard, and his plane is never seen again. Other such Mayday transmissions exist, such as the final transmission of pilot Jose Pagan Santos off the coast of Puerto Rico in 1980. He was coming in, the, in this airplane when all of a sudden they began sending Maydays. Mayday, Mayday, we are lost. We have a very weird, big, strange object in front of us that has taken us, of course. They describe it as luminous. Uh, it was harassing them. In order to avoid the collision with the object, they had to keep veering away to the northwest, getting away from the island more and more. Uh, they sent three May days. There was a jetliner coming out from the Dominican Republic, from Iberia, a jetliner from Spain. From Spain, uh, he was going from Santo Domingo to Madrid, Spain, and he could hear uh, their pleas for help and their May days. Uh, apparently, for some reason unknown, they couldn't get in touch with the uh, communication center of the FAA in San Juan International Airport, and the jetliner served as a relay between them in their communications and San Juan International Airport and the FAA offices. And it's, you can hear that very well, very defined in the in the transmission. I have a source in the. Federal Aviation Administration back in Puerto Rico who made me a copy of that uh, recording they have on the May that gave. Unfortunately, I, I, I believe I had brought with me, but apparently I left it at home. Uh, the thing is that they keep saying that this object is getting nearer and nearer, and all of a sudden they sound very alarmed, and suddenly everything stops. And the Illinois keep trying to get in contact with them, but nothing happened. And they just disappear. There was a very big search made by his father and many other people in Haiti, in Santo Domingo, in Puerto Rico, the Navy, U.S. Navy, Dominican Navy, civilian pilots, military pilots, Coast Guard. Uh, nothing was ever found. Though these cases are well documented, direct video footage offers to us the most poignant examples of UFO predation. In 2014, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 vanished over the Pacific Ocean without a trace. Like the aircraft in the previous examples, it too lost radio transmission and began to Nobody fly off course. Nobody expects a 777 to vanish. It just doesn't happen. 
Welcome back. We continue to follow breaking news out of the Far East. A Boeing 777 is missing. They lost contact. Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 with 239 people on board vanished from radio and radar contact about two hours into its flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Uh, we are talking about a Boeing 777-200. It is considered to be among the world's safest planes. It vanished without any distress call, no other indication that anything was wrong. Now, half a week later, nine countries, including the U.S. and Australia, have joined a search that has been focusing on the Gulf of Thailand between Malaysia and Vietnam, but is now extending west into Indonesia and east into the South China Sea. And the uh, this is just a situation that is is both understandably scary to those who fly on planes, the idea that the plane could just disappear. But it's also confusing to the search teams because how could so many presumably well coordinated resources be having so much trouble finding the uh, anything, any evidence that this plane was there? Where is Malaysia Airlines Flight 370? People have been asking about that, about black holes and on and on and on and all of these conspiracy theories. Let's look at this. Uh, Noah says, what else can you think about? Black hole, Bermuda Triangle. And then Deji says, huh, just like the movie Lost. I know it's preposterous, but it, is it preposterous, you think, Mary? <laughs> Don't answer, Mary, it's a trap! <laughs> The fate of Malaysian Flight 370 remains shrouded in mystery, and few theories have ever adequately explained how a Boeing 777 in radio, radar, and satellite contact could simply vanish midair, why its emergency transponder failed, or why no floating debris has ever been found. However, the following little-known video footage, shot authentically from a U.S. Air Force drone, and leaked online just months after the disappearance of Flight 370 may shed some light on the mystery and give us a glimpse into the fates of other missing aviators. Besides chance encounters, many pilots have been directed to pursue and even attack UFO craft. In probably the first and most famous incident in America, 
Pilot Thomas Mantell died in pursuit of a UFO over Fort Knox, Kentucky in 1948. He was sent to investigate a large metallic circular object observed for a long period of time flying in the vicinity of Godman Army Airfield. Without supplemental oxygen, the steep climb of Mantell's aircraft in pursuit of the unknown object probably caused him to black out, spiraling back to the surface of the earth. A similar account comes to us from Captain William Schaffner, who on September 8, 1970, was scrambled from RAF Station Binbrook to intercept an unknown craft over to the North Sea. Schaffner promptly disappeared. His aircraft discovered nearly three months later by Royal Navy divers where it had come to gently rest on the seafloor. Remarkably, Schaffner's BAC Lightning was mostly intact and lacked any of the expected signs of high-speed impact. Even more unbelievable was the absence of his body in the wreckage, even though the jet was found with its canopy closed and the seatbelt still fastened. On the death of Mantell, historian David Jacobs notes, The fact that a person had died in an encounter with an alleged flying saucer dramatically increased public concern about the phenomenon. Now a dramatic new prospect entered thought about UFOs. They might be not only extraterrestrial, but potentially hostile as well. In an even more disturbing clip, notice the way the police officer here bizarrely leans back, impossibly off of his center of gravity, before being melted by a powerful beam of light from above. When we see videos of UFOs pacing cars and blasting them with light, often leaving their occupants with burns and radiation sickness, we should keep such videos in mind. In some cases, animals and even humans are abducted, experimented on, and even killed. A typical mutilation is characterized by sudden unexplained death, missing organs, and bizarre cuts which are only hide deep. The parts taken are similar in all the reported cases. An eye. The tissue around an eye. The sexual organs are gone. The tongue, completely so deep in the throat that it often takes the larynx and the trachea. There might be an eye removed with the eyelashes still intact and the rectal tissue in probably 95% of the cases cord out. There is no blood. You might have a little bit of pooling uh, in the body cavity. Why? Sometimes the tail. It is quite a sight when you see one. Some believe that the wounds found in cases of mutilation are evidence of a desire to harvest vital chemicals found only in the brain and only under certain conditions. There are some who even believe that many of the missing and exploited people of our world are being abducted by not only predatory extraterrestrials, but also by people in collaboration with them for the purpose of acquiring these unique neural compounds. Medical science does not know the instruments used to carry out the unbelievably precise surgical operations. We have reported about 20 to 25 cases in which UFOs approaching their witnesses just attack them for unknown reason. And in sometimes these attacks result in death of the victims. And there's a very special case that we are focusing our attention in the last six months which is the first case ever reported in the world of a human mutilation by extraterrestrial. The case happened, a man was found about 48 hours after his death, 
with several wounds, cuts in the body, and with removal of many vital organs. We have connected these cases to mutilations of animals that happened for 40 years all over the world and are made by extraterrestrial. Well, for instance, we have these photographs to show what we mean. This is a photograph made by the police of the state of Sao Paulo. You can see holes in the man's upper arm near the shoulders, and you can see that the, the tissues from the mandibles of the man were extracted, and the cuts were precisely done in countering the bonds of the face. The eyes were also removed along with great extensions of tissues along the head. Many holes were found, symmetrical holes, perforations were found in the man's head throughout which were extracted part of the brain tissue. This is a very amazing picture, but it's very, very similar, fantastically similar to the ones we have taken from animal mutilated all over the world. You said a word a minute ago, and I, I want to clarify what that word was, because you said a word, yeah. and I want to make sure that you said adrenochrome. Yeah. And a lot of people here, there's about 4,500 people here. There's yeah. uh, about a half million people streaming online. We're having some cyber attacks that feed's been going on and off. It's, it's a, but you said that word, and by yeah. a show of hands, who's heard that word before in this building? Could you please explain to the extent that you want to or not want to what that is because some people have never heard that before and we need to discuss that never mind it's absolutely pure what kind of monster client have you hooked up with this time satanism freak i think there's only one source for this stuff the uh adrenaline gland from a living human body i know the guy didn't have any cash to pay me. He offered me human blood, said it would take me higher than I'd ever been in my life. But he was kidding. Oh, so I told him I'd just as soon have an ounce of so pure adrenochrome. Or maybe just a fresh adrenaline gland to chew on. I could already feel the stuff working on me. The first wave felt like a combination of mescaline and methadry. Maybe I should take a swim, I thought. Sir, they nailed this guy for child molesting. He swore he didn't do it. Why should I fuck with children, he said. They're too small. Christ, what could I say? Even a goddamn werewolf is entitled to legal counsel. Didn't dare to turn a creep down. Might have picked up a letter opener and gone after my... Okay. Be quiet. Be calm. Name? Frank. And press affiliation. Nothing else. They chopped the goddamn head off right there in the parking lot, then they cut all kinds of holes in her and sucked out the blood. They wrapped the penal gland, I think. Yeah. No, how's your mama? You know, the blood sacrifices, the whole Luciferian thing, the, the kids being killed and eaten. I mean, that humans have been eaten and taken off planet, et cetera, et cetera, and used for slaves in other colonies, et cetera. I hate to say that, but that's far worse than what you've just said. It's okay. far worse. Yes, far worse. Far worse, uh, yeah. And uh, that, the whole blood situation uh, is... Uh, it's unbelievable, and um, right. I don't know how we say that to the public. When we get into that, if we release it, 70, 80 percent of everybody that listens to your program is going to say, you're smoking pot. I don't believe that, and I don't believe anything you people talk about on extraterrestrial, and it's going to kill what disclosure is trying to do. Humans are not protecting themselves. They're not protected. And so if you don't warn them, you're culpable. The next time somebody gets yeah. snatched and eaten or taken away or their child, and it's, I'm more concerned by the, about the children, obviously, than 
than anything else. That's um, you know. That's it. Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hi. Um, I, 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 I don't have a whole lot of uh, time. Um, well, look, look, let's begin yeah. by finding out whether you're using this line properly or not. You know. I, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago, and, and <laughs> I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh, man, I don't know where to start. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're going to... Um, they'll triangulate on this position really, really soon. Um, well, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone, so give us something quick. Okay. Um, um, okay, well, what we're thinking of as, as aliens are, they're, uh, they're, they're extra-dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the um, space program made contact with. Uh, they they are not what they claim to be. Uh, they have infiltrated a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects of, of of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. Uh, the, the disasters that are coming. They the, the military. I'm sorry. The, the government knows about them, and there's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now are but they're not doing they're not doing anything they are not they want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable discharge <laughs> I still can't get it. In some way, something knocked us off the air, and we're on a backup system now. I've had an experience where I had a very senior person in the U.S. government told me, flat out, Lou, we want you to stop this program. And my response was, well, okay, sir, I, I, I can understand that, but can you, can you give me the reason why? Uh, because from our perspective, these things are absolutely real. We, we are seeing these, we're recording them, we've got the date on them. And the response back to me was, Lou, we're not arguing that they're real. We know they're real, but we don't think we don't think you know what they really are. And so at that point, I'm thinking, oh, maybe this is some sort of secret right. U.S. kind of program that they didn't read me onto, which I'm fine with. Uh, and I said, well, okay, sir, that's that's fine. And his response back to me was, what you're dealing with are demonic beings. The elite are all about transcendence and living forever and the secrets of the universe, and they want to know all this. The elites themselves believe they're racing using human technology to try to take our best minds and build some type of breakaway civilization where they're going to merge with machines, transcend, and break away from the failed species that is man. There's now a human counter-strike taking place to shut this off before it gets fully into place and to block these systems and to try to have an actual debate about where humanity goes and cut off the pedophiles and psychic vampires that are control of this AI system before humanity is destroyed. Wait a minute, humanity is only control of AI? How'd well, they get, how'd the pedophiles get in control of well, AI? Well, the, the pedophiles, at a, at a whatever level, rule. the devil, whatever you want to call it, this interdimensional thing that gives them advanced off-world technology, the fallen one that's not of this world, is giving them advanced knowledge what? What on how to construct about? these what is, systems what is that have that? already been used before on other populations. What? Is that Satan? But what are you, what are you talking Satan. about? Let's say, but explain that. You just you're well, saying Satan something becomes insane. something that the, you know the stupid preacher tells you about, who's totally controlled, or something you read about on you know in the news or TV. Right. But this is an interdimensional force that wants to influence us to build something that absorbs us and kills us, rather than the divine uh, free will we're given to build something much better that empowers the, the species. So the species is now making a decision Where are you about its entire from? future. Where are you getting this from? From that's what it is. But where are you getting it from? I know, from the, from looking at all the data, researching it, studying it, watching the enemy. That's the big decision that humanity has now got before us.
The prospect of human collaboration in their own harvest is of course the most terrifying prospect of all. Since it suggests the involvement of not only the richest and most powerful people in the world, but the government itself. Because of this, the theory of human collaboration in their own strange harvest is regarded by many as the most closely guarded secret surrounding UFOs. But even without the assistance of sinister forces, over 30,000 people go missing every year. While most of these cases are resolved normally and many of these people are eventually found, a few stand out and defy explanation. People that seem to be picked up and carried off where they stand only to be dropped off miles away. Missing hikers that are found in places that have been searched numerous times, that seem to jump through or have missing time, or are found in totally impossible places. Cases like these occur in hotspots all around the country, as documented for years by researcher and former police officer David Politis in his many books and on his channel, Missing 411. Although no lower form of wildlife can account for these missing persons, a higher form of wildlife can. Beyond the terrifying prospect of UFO predation and human collaboration, other topics beyond intended disclosure are keeping UFOs secret too. With torsion physics and related technology, humans could totally revolutionize their civilization. Every time we see a UFO, we see the limitless possibilities and total absolute freedom offered to us were it not for the enforced secrecy surrounding torsion physics and UFOs. Instead, under increased control by centralized authorities, our civilization may instead be headed for the next and perhaps final dark age and a new perpetual feudalism. In a story told time and time again throughout our history, when the ruling class is allowed to develop a significant technological edge over the public, a dark age transpires, and the people are made to toil in the fields, witless and ignorant, while the rich live in splendor in their castles, reading books, forging steel, and examining the sky through telescopes. In our modern age, leaving the technologies that come to us from torsion physics in the hands of the rich is just like leaving the reading and writing to the nobility in medieval Europe, a tactical mistake that had to be corrected before the people could ever give themselves a Magna Carta or a constitution. By many accounts, private research conducted by the ruling class by way of the government and its contractors into torsion physics and related technologies has been conducted for nearly a century now. Thankfully, in America, enough mechanisms exist that such research might yet still be wrestled out of the hands of the rich and powerful and back into the hands of the people. Next Wednesday, July 26th at 10 a.m., the House Oversight Committee will hold a hearing on, on unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAPs. I prefer to call them UFOs. Last year, the House Intelligence Committee held a hearing on UAPs. They brought in some Pentagon bureaucrats who, had, who only had two answers to the questions they were asked. I don't know, or that's classified. This hearing is going to be different. We are going to have witnesses who can speak frankly to public about their experiences. We've had a heck of a lot of pushback about this hearing. We've had members of Congress who fought us. We've had members of the intelligence community and also the Pentagon. Even NASA backed out on us. There are a lot of people who don't want this to come to light. In astrospheric theory, we can unify the different theories of UFOs and make sense of how all of us humanoids and the craft we build are just well-adapted organisms Furthermore, when we take into account the coevolutionary nature of other humanoids in this new habitat, whose substrate is space-time itself, we are given a new way to think about the whole thing. If a jungle is a place of bewildering complexity and ruthless competition, then from the point of view of the astrosphere, the observable universe is really a space-time jungle an entirely new, nearly overwhelming frontier and ecosystem.
This is the final terminating point of the UFO iceberg. If we start at the summit, which represents being totally unaware, then the terminating point is jungle space-time, the point of full disclosure. Although our true higher dimensional world and the full disclosure that comes with it may be bewildering and even a little scary, it's something we all deserve to know. In the words of John F. Kennedy, a nation that is afraid to let its people judge the truth or falsehood in an open market is a nation that is afraid of its people. If you liked today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to know more about astrospheric theory, you can find the Space Time Jungle on Amazon, and I'll drop a link for that below the video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. We watched that stage burn out, we watched the second stage burn out, we watched the third stage burn out, and into the frame came something else. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, which is represented by my thumb here. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of, the, out of space. Now I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Klass can kiss my ass. He wasn't there. I was. Now when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. Um, who really do we think we are? We are we're a fifth-rate, miserable, measly little system out on the edge of the Milky Way. Oh, and the moment anybody suggests that something should come in outside from, uh, from outside, we think, oh, no, 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 it can't be that, it can't be that. It's, it's quite out, you know, these things can't happen. I don't know what it is. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share.